Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much for. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for joining our panel, Human Rights in Islam Theory and Practice. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm your uh, host today, Hannah Zuberi, and uh, I will be joined by three, uh, four very uh, prestigious panelists. And without further ado, this, um, you are watching us on Galaxy 19 at the, on, on the Muslim Network TV. You are also watching us on YouTube and the Justice for All Facebook page. Um, Justice for All is a human rights um, organization, a Muslim-led human rights organization, and uh, we are broadcasting today on the Justice in Ramadan conference, which is our first annual international justice conference. Thank you so much for being here for the past three days, and uh, this is one of our final panels, and inshallah, we hope to put a lot of what we have discussed in the past two days in perspective um, through um, the Islamic lens, inshallah. So without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce my pan co-panelist. Okay, um, so going up first uh, will be Sheikh Hamza Maqbul. Uh, Sheikh Hamza, was born in California, Whittier, California, and has lived in Southern California um, and then in Washington. Uh, he went on to attend the University of Washington and in 2004 completed a Bachelor's of Science in Biochemistry and a Bachelor of Arts in Near Eastern Studies and Language and Civilizations. After graduation, Sheikh Hamza went on to pursue traditional Islamic studies, which took him to a number of countries, including Syria and Egypt, where he studied Arabic language, um, then to Morocco and Mauritania and the United Arab Emirates, where he studied the madhab of Imam Malik, grammar, usul al-hadith, and two renditions of the qira of Imam Nafi, Warsh and Qalun. Um, and finally, he went to Pakistan, where he had the opportunity to study tafsir, Usul uh, al-Hadith, uh, Hadith al rijal and Hanafi Fiqh. After his return to the United States, Sheikh Hamza spent five years as a res resident scholar of the Thawr Institute. He is currently the Imam of the Islamic Center of Cleveland and the resident scholar for Ribat, a center for learning and remembrance in the Midwest United States. Thank you, Jazakallah Khair, Sheikh Hamza, for being here today and taking time of your, out of your busy Ramadan schedule. Um, as we had spoken about, about before, um, the mission of Justice for All as an organization is the prophetic mission of Qist. And we wanted to understand what Qist means. Um, and uh, we are delighted that you're here uh, to explain that to us. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله تبارك وتعالى وسلم على سيدنا محمد سيدنا وسندنا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا ومولانا صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه وضرياته وأهل بيته ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد uh, before we continue uh, can can I get some just a confirmation that, that the audio and everything is working just so that we don't and get two, three minutes into this thing and then realize we have to do a sound check. Yes, from my end, I can hear. Alhamdulillah, wonderful. So to uh, uh, address the, the first uh, question with regards to qist, the word qist is an interesting uh, word uh, in the Arabic language. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, 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 says in his, uh, in his book, uh, say, Ya Muhammad alayka salatu was salam, that my Lord commands to qist, uh, to justice, wa aqimu wujuhakum inda kulli masjid, and that you should establish your faces, meaning you should be present in every place of prayer uh, with frequency and regularity. 
وَدْعُوهُ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ كَمَا بَدَأَكُمْ يَعُودُونَ In the same way that uh, and call upon him, making your, uh, your, your entire way of life and your entire understanding of life, uh, your entire system of life uh, purely for him. Because one day, just as he uh, started your creation, you will also end up with him. And this uh, word qist also has a, a, a type of a per permutation. It's been, dis it, it, it's been discussed by the uh, Usuli scholars, the scholars of uh, the theoretical uh, derivation of not just the, the sacred law, but of creed uh, and uh, other theoretical matters in deen. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been connected to another word qistas, uh, which is uh, also, uh, in fact, strangely enough, uh, to most uh, American uh, viewers and English-speaking viewers, is actually a cognate for a word in English. Uh, the uh, Usuli scholars discuss the word qistas actually being a, a loan word into the Arabic language from Latin. And uh, the word qistas is actually uh, used or uh, read in the riway of Nafi', the riway of Medina from the Qira'at uh, uh, Sab'a, the seven canonical recitations of the Quran is qustas. Uh, and uh, qustas is actually a cognate for the word justice. It's actually a cognate for the, the, the word that we use in English, justice. Qustas is actually the, the same word. And uh, if you, uh, I don't, you know, I, I, in order to avoid this becoming too much of a digression into uh, linguistics, um, but if you look at regular phonological changes in the uh, pronunciation of, of Arabic words uh, amongst different uh, uh, Arab tribal groups and affiliations, the people who live in the eastern part of the Arabian Peninsula in Qatar and in uh, the uh, uh, what we call now the United Arab, em Arab Emirates, oftentimes they'll actually turn the qaf into a jim, so qasim will turn into jasim, etc. So it's actually, justas is actually literally sounds uh, like the word justice as well. But uh, qist is by far not the only word that is used in uh, uh, in the Quran in order to describe the concept of justice. In fact, the word the the, the concept of justice is described by a, a an ambit of different terms. If somebody wishes to see what the Quran says about justice, let them look at the word adal. Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsani wa ita'i dhil qurba wa yanha an al fahshai wal munkari wal baghi. Indeed, Allah Taala commands to uh, justice. As the uh, as the basic ruling uh, by which uh, human beings should deal with one another, indeed Allah Taala commands to justice. In Allah ya'muru bil adal wal ihsan, and then on top of that, there is a commandment uh, on top of that, which is ihsan, which literally means to make things beautiful, and functionally it means uh, to uh, give uh, more than what you're uh, required to give and to take less than uh, is your right to take in every transaction. Uh, and in uh, in our theology, it means to worship Allah Ta'ala as if you see him, and if you don't, at least to carry the awareness with you at all times and places that, uh, that he sees you. Uh, and that is a commandment that's higher than justice. Um, the uh, expression uh, mizan is used. Uh, and mizan uh, is uh, the word meaning the instrumentalis, the the, the 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 instrument that's used in order to weigh and in order to measure things, uh, to measure weight uh, in, in particular. And so uh, Allah Taala aqimul wazna bil qisti wa la tuxsirul mizan, and you are uh, commanded uh, to uh, establish. Uh, 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 the uh, measures that you give out to people uh, in justice and uh, never allowed to stint or shortchange people in that uh, in that in that measuring in that system and institution of measuring. So you see, there's a you know justice is very central to uh, the, the 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 theory of, of of Islam in particular in regards to. Uh, your uh, uh, your interaction with the rest of the creation. And uh, so the first thing I wanted to mention is this, is that the teaching of Islam is such that uh, justice is not seen as a, 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 a an end, and nor is it seen as uh, a 
perfect situation. Um, and that is rooted in a theological concept, which is what is that whatever you do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever you do for the sake of Allah, you'll never be able to repay your debt to him. And because of that, uh, a person who uh, clamors for justice in every single transaction that they have, that person, if they were to, uh, under the rule of Kamat to Deen to Dan, the way you dish it out is one day the way you're going to end up taking it. Under the rule of justice itself, that person will come up short on the day of judgment when they, uh, when they uh, have an account with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so uh, the idea is this is that a person who is in, in in a hierarchical relationship. There's always hierarchical relationships, whether they be in the home, like parents and children, or the elder sibling and the younger sibling, or in society, like rulers and the people who are being ruled by them, uh, the, the wealthy and the poor. In every hierarchical uh, uh, relationship, uh, the the Muslim is expected to, expected to uh, rather than demanding justice, uh, in fact, to forego their uh, rights to some degree and to forgive uh, uh, grievances uh, as legitimate as they they may be in order to uh, in order to aid and ease and facilitate the running of society and such a forgiveness is actually considered to be a uh, an act of piety allah ta'ala says in his book uh, that uh, uh, Never let uh, uh, the worst of a people. Shana'an is a uh, word in the Arabic language. It is the plural of the word shani', like from Surat Al Kothar, Inna Shani Akahu Al Abitar. Shani' means uh, uh, an enemy, and in particular, that enemy which has no redeeming quality or trait, that enemy which is uh, worthy of being despised fully. There's no nobility in them, nor are they a worthy adversary. They're just a bad person. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not allow the shana'an, uh, do not allow such people from uh, your enemies to turn you into a criminal, and to, to completely turn you into a criminal such that you're not just with one another. Uh, rather be just, uh, that is closer to uh, taqwa, that is closer to the fear of God and the consciousness of God. Uh, and therefore, uh, we see that justice is uh, not the goal of Islam, rather it is the floor if you cannot be uh, just with other people, then you're not even a human being. You know, if you're a just person, you're not uh, to boast amongst people about how wonderful you are. Uh, rather, you have done what uh, is the minimum expectation of being a human being. Uh, and uh, that is the floor. We reserve justice for our enemies uh, and uh, for the people who we see any good in whatsoever. We're encouraged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in fact, to forego rights, to forgive rights, to uh, uh, you know, to help the function of society uh, by not being a stickler for uh, every uh, uh, every demand that uh, is is due to us uh, personally, uh, and then we move on further than this, which is uh, a a question regarding what the point of justice is in the Sharia, and where is it going to be found. And uh, the, the first question uh, with regards to what the point of justice is, uh, because the, the, you know, the, the thought may occur to somebody, well, look, if, uh, uh, you know, if people should forgive anyway, and uh, on top of that, the day of judgment, right? The day of judgment, we, we translate the expression Yom ad -Din as the day of judgment. I think the day of justice is also not a, 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 a improper uh, translation of that expression. The word Deen here, uh, it doesn't mean uh, religion uh, as most people translate it, although I think even uh, in the context where religion is somewhat more of an appropriate translation, I think still it's uh, it's anemic, it's a bit inadequate for what the, the concept of deen is. Uh, but here, deen doesn't even mean that. Uh, here, deen means, uh, uh, deen means uh, uh, justice, and it means in par particular re requital. Uh, the Hebrew language, and the Hebrew language, the word for a court is Beit Din, and Hebrew being a Semitic language, which is uh, 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 genetically related to Arabic, um, this is the meaning of the word Din in the expression Yom ad Din, that Allah Ta'ala is Maliki Yom ad Din and Maliki Yom ad Din. He is the master on the day of judgment, and he is the king on the day of judgment, meaning the monarch, the, the, the one who rules uh, through solitary rule without 
uh, sharing that rule on anybody else. Uh, Yom al din is the, the, the day of judgment, the day of justice. One of the names of Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Athar of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Ad-Dayyan, the one who uh, takes vengeance for every wrong uh, which is perpetrated. Uh, and so the question may occur, well, what's the point of having justice in this world? If, uh, uh, if Allah Ta'ala is going to restore everything on the other side anyway, uh, and Allah Ta'ala is going to forgive the people of faith anyway. And the answer to that is this, is uh, uh, first of all, the uh, re restoration is going to be harsher on that side. And more fundamentally, uh, the way the, the system works uh, in this world is that if everybody is distracted all the time, if everybody is distracted all the time trying to figure out uh, you know, how they're going to survive, how, how they're going to make a living, uh, who is going to rob them, who is going to harm them, who is going to steal from their family, who is going to uh, give them uh, uh, grief around every corner, then the higher functions of the mind and the uh, higher aims and objectives uh, of a human being higher than, uh, you know, a very animalistic and chimpanzee-like concern with, uh, with, with like the physical integrity of the body and uh, you know w where the next threat is coming from. Uh, those things are not, you know, you're never going to reach them. Allah Ta'ala says in his book, he says, In a very short surah, the Surah Quraysh, uh, which maybe many of our viewers have, in fact, uh, uh, even memorized. Um, Allah Ta'ala literally says to the mushrikeen of Quraysh before they have accepted Islam, uh, his expectation that they should worship him. فَلْيَعْبُدُوا Let them worship the Lord of this house, meaning the Lord of the Kaaba, the one who uh, uh, fed them so that they're no longer hungry, and the one who gave them uh, uh, security so that they no longer have to live in fear. And the idea is this: is that uh, uh, the justice in this world will never be able to will never be able to measure up to the justice of the Lord on the day of judgment. This is this is a fact, uh, and it never was really you know it was never really meant to even try uh, because that's uh, uh, something that we're always going to fall short of. But the point of it is that we should be able to live with one another in this world enough, uh, with enough uh, peace and safety and security that uh, the minds and the hearts of people should be uh, free to think about and to uh, look at uh, m higher objectives and higher aims of being a human being uh, rather than just uh, you know defending against uh, defending against people trying to rob cheat steal harm enslave uh, or or uh, in any other way uh, hurt them or uh, or or uh, take from them and that's that's not really possible unless uh, people know that uh, violating uh, uh, any sort of order that, that uh, allows for peace and security in this world and, and for uh, an individual to be able to live a meaningful and fulfilled life, uh, that uh, that's going to have some immediate repercussions. Because if everybody was good at fearing the long-term repercussions of the hereafter, this world would be a, a, a very different place. Uh, and so... Uh, we have this idea that, that there is a system that we were commanded to uh, observe in this world, which is uh, uh, there to be uh, partially restorative and partially to be a deterrent. And uh, I think a lot of Muslims underestimate the, the, you know, the, 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 the deterrence uh, value of, uh, of, of justice. It's a usuli discussion amongst the ulama of the madhahib that the, the, the had punishments, the corporal punishments that are uh, sacredly mandated in, in, in Islam, um, what the purpose is of them. And so the Jamhur opinion is that uh, a person who receives one of those punishments has received the punishment for their sin in this world and is absolved of, uh, absolved of responsibility for it in the hereafter. But a very strong position is attributed to Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala that the only point of even those sacred punishments, the only reason for their mandate is zajar, is a deterrence and uh, the sin uh, it, it, uh, that for the person who breaks those laws, even if they receive the, uh, the, the such a punishment, it still remains upon the head of the person who perpetrates that crime uh, until and unless they uh, until and unless they um, repent for it. 
And uh, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, actually, there's a, a, an interesting hadith, uh, which I remember from my study of the Mishkat al-Masabih, uh, of a case of two disputants who came to him from Hadramaut, which is a place in the, uh, in the southern Arabian Peninsula, uh, in the eastern part of what we, uh, the nation state that we now refer to as Yemen, although it was, I think, traditionally considered a separate country from Yemen or a separate uh, nation from Yemen. And the two Hadramis came to the Prophet ﷺ with a property dispute. And they said, you be the judge between us. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, 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 you know, mandated the Prophet ﷺ and mandated the people of knowledge uh, uh, with him uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, judge, uh, uh, to judge uh, in cases uh, when they're brought according to the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, that when you judge between the, the people that you should uh, judge with justice in Allah what a wonderful uh, uh, and what a uh, blessed thing that Allah Ta'ala uh, commands you to so uh, these two they bring their property dispute to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which is from hundreds, hundreds of miles away and, and there is a, a great void uh, between them and it essentially, the case breaks down to he said, she uh, he said, she said. It breaks down to hearsay. There's no definitive uh, uh, proof in the right of either disputant. So the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, before giving his ruling, he says uh, he says uh, the following uh, in paraphrase that uh, uh, you know I'm not a I, I'm not somebody who knows the unseen. And the two of you brought this uh, uh, dispute to me. And now I have a procedural way of settling dis the dispute, uh, which is that I will ask the, uh, uh, I will ask the person who's in possession, uh, the, the person who is making the, 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 the claim, the plaintiff, to uh, swear an oath on his claim. And then I will ask the defendant to swear an oath against the oath of the plaintiff. And then uh, whoever has the, the property in hand, uh, given an absence of uh, de decisive uh, evidence one way or the other, uh, I will affirm their ownership and uh, uh, then we'll be done with the case. However, uh, you know, as a person of the Akhirah, as a person who's come to teach you about the hereafter, uh, I tell you that Allah knows exactly what's happening. Allah Ta'ala knows exactly what's happening. And if either of you uh, is using the, the system of the government or using the system of, uh, of uh, the court and the judge, in order to uh, uh, procedurally take the right of his brother away from him wrongfully, then know that the ju judgment that I'm about to give you, all I'm doing is breaking off a piece of the hellfire and handing it to you. And so if either of you out of fear of Allah Ta'ala wish to forego their claim and be safe on the day of judgment, let them do so. And uh, after pausing, one of them uh, uh, then says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that I forego my claim. Uh, and not necessarily meaning that he he was even wrong, but just because of the 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 fear of the ambiguity uh, of using that system incorrectly, um, he 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 forewent his claim. And this is also a very powerful lesson to us, which is what, which is that oftentimes we have uh, uh, claims and we feel very confident about them, but just the possibility that we may be wrong or maybe uh, uh, not ob objective in our in our judgment, it means that we should. Uh, also, uh, uh, also forgive in order for uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to forgive us. Again, I mentioned the uh, the condition in the beginning of uh, of a hierarchical relationship. The Sunnah is to do so when you're in a position of power and a position position of authority and position to take what you want by force, one way or the other. There are other situations in which the uh, uh, the the divine mandate comes down in favor of taking justice and taking vengeance on. Uh, the part of people, and that's for those who are being uh, uh, that that's for those who are being uh, uh, oppressed and being uh, dominated, and when the oppressor uh, seems to be uh, completely uh, 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 flagrant in their, in their violation of the sacred law. But this is a little bit of uh, an exposition about the idea of justice from a very general uh, point of view. My understanding was that this uh, uh, discussion, panel discussion in today's uh, uh, today's uh, online conference, will move from uh, from from the theoretical and the abstract to the particular and the concrete, which is the way that any uh, sound approach to uh, learning about something, uh, at least theoretically, should take. 
And uh, uh, the last, uh, uh, you know, couple of comments I just wanted to make was was uh, uh, two things. One is that if you look at the history of our uh, uh, of our mashaykh, starting with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then extending to uh, the the rule of the Khulafa Rashidun, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Umar, Sayyidina Uthman, Sayyidina Ali radiyallahu taala anhum ajma'in, uh, and then going through uh, uh, the history of uh, the the righteous and pious uh, kings and sultans uh, and uh, uh, leaders uh, of, uh, of uh, the Islamic history. This concept was very uh, was very deep with them, and it ran very deep with them. Uh, and uh, uh, that's why you see uh, things like uh, the you know the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, despite being the absolute ruler uh, of Medina Munawwara. Uh, um, by uh, you know today's political uh, uh, terminology, uh, despite that, when he would have a dispute or someone would have a dispute for, with him, uh, particularly from minority communities, like you know there was a dispute about a loan uh, uh, once uh, or a business transaction between him and one of the Jews of Medina, and uh, uh, they picked a neutral third party arbitrator, despite the fact that uh, uh, you know his word would uh, uh, you know make uh, things uh, up or down in Medina, but he would be very careful not to, uh, uh, not to uh, dilute that justice. And uh, likewise, uh, uh, Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, his stories are legendary about uh, people who are non-Muslim minorities coming to, coming to him in Medina Munawwara and complaining about their treatment, uh, ill treatment that they received at the hands of uh, Muslim governors or commanders and Sayyidina Umar would actually run a trial and run a case which was very strange for that 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 time um, and he would uh, give uh, the uh, uh, you know he would give the justice and the punishment uh, uh, to the poor against the rich or to the minorities against the majority uh, in order that that justice uh, not be violated uh, and that's something that we could have like a complete separate like two hour talk about um, the examples uh, thereof um, but, uh, uh, you know, that, that's something that was very important for, for the reasons that we mentioned. That a person, if they cannot even be just in this world, uh, that means that they're going to show up with a, a very poor face on the Day of Judgment. Uh, and the last thing that I, I wanted to mention uh, is that uh, I think in the context uh, that, that is about to uh, take flight after uh, the, the very near ending of my talk, um, things that are happening around the world are our problem. Uh, things that are happening around the world uh, are our problem. Things that are happening to the weak that cannot defend uh, themselves. We who uh, uh, live in privilege and live in luxury and uh, uh, are empowered politically and have a disproportionately powerful uh, uh, influence on the way politics works, not only in this country, but around the world. Um, we do have we do have a, a a responsibility toward our brothers and sisters in other places uh, who are really just uh, being uh, being uh, treated as if they're not even human beings. Our brothers and sisters in uh, Turkestan, uh, um, the Uyghur speaking people who are uh, literally in concentration camps in China. Our brothers and sisters, Rohingya uh, uh, brothers and sisters in Burma. Uh, who are literally, uh, uh, again, uh, you know, who are genocided out of their lands and like living on an island in the middle of, um, in the middle of this pandemic uh, in complete lockdown. And uh, it seems that the world has turned their back on them. Not to say that other Muslim populations in uh, China or in Burma are, 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 are faring well, but these are particularly egregious, uh, uh, you know, breaches of just their humanity. You know, our brothers and sisters in the Central African Republic, which very few people ever have heard of, um, it is our it is it is our duty. Allah will ask us about them, and He's not going to ask us why didn't you fix their problem. If any of you are able to fix the problem, what what are you waiting for? Just go do it. But uh, uh, that thing that you cannot uh, uh, fix a hundred percent, you're also not allowed to just like leave it to crash and burn a hundred percent. How come we didn't speak about it? How come we didn't give money to those people who are doing something about that cause? How come we didn't write a letter to our uh, our, our political leaders. How come we didn't mention it in our in our gatherings uh, as Muslims and keep their their memory alive? Um, and uh, uh, you know, it's a big ummah. You know, if everybody does just a little bit, it has a huge effect. 
Uh, and on the flip side, you know, with especially particularly with the the, the really embarrassing situation uh, with our brothers and sisters in in in, in Turkestan, um, literally it seems that every country of the Muslim world has kowtowed to uh, uh, China and its political uh, uh, and its political and economic strings that it pulls. Uh, to the point where if everybody steps away from the cause, the cause ends up becoming uh, uh, nothing. And that's that's simply, it's simply unacceptable. And it is uh, 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 something really scary in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, uh, and so, uh, inshallah, uh, you know, in order to end this, this, this talk, I wanted to make sure it was less than half an hour. And uh, uh, inshallah, I'm going to deliver on that promise. Uh, don't just like listen to this and be, you know, be like, oh my God, justice, and then like move on to your your next uh, Ramadan Islamotainment event or to uh, some other next feeling that you're going to get out of Ramadan. Uh, just make a quick note and uh, uh, note to self and, uh, 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 you know, of some sort of action item. And I would appreciate it actually if um, the, the presenters also you know, give links to make it easy for people that, you know, send this letter to a member of Congress or donate to these organizations who are doing uh, this good uh, work um, uh, and doing this, uh, you know, you know, keeping this, uh, the, the, these uh, uh, causes moving uh, and, uh, uh, you know, donate to these organizations that are actually legitimately able to bring uh, money to, uh, uh, you know, to the people who are suffering from uh, these, uh, uh, you know, just huge debacles and huge uh, uh, human rights catastrophes around the world. Um, those yeah. are the things that on the day of judgment uh, uh, that will matter. Uh, and they will uh, have a great number of sins that a person commits. Uh, they will, will blot them out. And uh, they will be a reason that a person can show face in front of Allah Ta'ala. Ya Allah, those people who were uh, underwater, uh, uh, in this world, we didn't forget them, and we uh, we did what we could for them. So this day that we're underwater with you, Ya Allah, uh, uh, you know, take pity on us as well, and uh, uh, give to us what you can, like we gave for them what we could. Allah Taala uh, give all of us tawfiq. Allah Taala make us people of of adil, of justice, and of ihsan, uh, of beauty. Uh, and uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, accept uh, all of your fasts and all of your prayers in this Mubarak month and make it a means uh, for for uh, all of our salvation in this world and in the hereafter from every trouble and every difficulty uh, mm -hmm. and uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it a means to change our lives for the better wa sallallahu tabaraka wa ta'ala wa sallama ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu Jazakallah uh, khair for that um, broad in, uh, introduction to the concept and um, and uh, for giving us the advice to not make it a fleeting moment, um, but to internalize it and make it one of those things that we accept during our Ramadan and continue to do post Ramadan as well. One of those habits uh, that inshallah we will do something for others um, every day of our life after Ramadan is over too. Um, for our next guest, I would like to invite um, Dr. Shadi Al-Masri. Um, uh, a brief introduction to Dr. Shadi. He was born and raised in New Jersey. He began to study traditional sciences at the age of 18 um, in Fez, Morocco. Since then, he had studied all over the world, including Hadr al-Maut in Yemen, Mecca in Medina, in London, and Cairo, and New Jersey, um, with several luminaries of our time. In addition to traditional learning, Dr. Masri received his PhD from the University of London in February 2007. Currently, Dr. Al Masri has found his way back home as scholar in residence and director of education and community affairs at the New Brunswick Islamic Center in New Jersey. He's also the founder and head of the Sina Society. And someone my daughters listen to regularly. So oh, good. <laughs> All of a sudden, I just perked up. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the uh, uh, introduction and for the chance to come out here and talk to everybody. It's a critical topic. And um, the first thing that I want to talk about is that there's theory and there's practice and there is Masa al fiqhiyah and there's ways of discussing, uh, you know, these subjects. And uh, when it comes to my topic, which is the companions, um, the one image that really 
summarizes the, if you want to talk about the pursuit of justice of the Sahaba. And when we talk about pursuit of justice, uh, first of all, did I even open up with the Basmala? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Uh, very much as Sheikh Hamza is, we're on like a Zoom uh, treadmill here uh, because everything is turned online and it's so easy that you could do four or five things a day that you sort of didn't even know um, where you are. You're sleeping and waking up between fasting and, and, and going on to Zoom and, uh, or StreamYard. So the one image that would give you an idea of, of a Sahabi standing for justice and that image is Sayyidina Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. Disheveled. He never was someone who combed himself or combed his hair or anything like that. He was always like disheveled, big beard. He had a woolen uh, type of one type of fro frock that he used to wear. A and he had a stick. And at this point, he was old, uh, you know, older you know, in a dignified way. He had, uh, you know, white hair, white beard, and he had went to Syria. And he was standing on a hill, and at this time, and there were youth and children around him. And this is one of the most amazing periods in the history of the Ummah. It happened. This we're talking about the Khilafah of Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan, and the children of Syria run to him, all shouting in ayah of the Quran, which is. And Abu Dhar now begins his speech. And Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, he ends up being a figure, a person, in the time of Sayyidina Uthman's time, in the time of great wealth for the Ummah, who really starts... If you want to, so the, I'm not I'm not into these you know these catchphrases of speaking truth to power, right? But that's really what he was. He was one of the only voices that went out and started saying, "Hold on a second, these new emirs that we have, they're not doing things the way Abu Bakr and Omar and the prophets of said them did. They're not doing things the right way, and they're taking all this wealth for themselves. They're not distributing." the kharaj properly they're not distributing the taxes properly that are coming from these newly conquered territories or the wealth that's conquered from these territories they're not distributing it properly properly they're not taking care of the, and and he's not saying uh he's not saying uh tawa which is voluntary sadaqa he's talking about the obligation obligatory sadaqa he's not just saying oh you're getting rich and the other people are poor no he's talking about their obligatory sadaqa or the obligatory kharaj that they have to distribute, or spoils of war that they have to distribute. He's saying that, that that obligatory thing is what they're not distributing. And so he had an anthem, you could say, a logo or a, or a motto. And that motto was a book, a verse from the Book of Allah. You can say that it's one of the first mottos in Islam. Okay. Well, there are actually a couple mottos. For example, uh, Khalid ibn Walid, he had a motto when he would go into battle, right? Uh, in which he would actually call on the Prophet's name, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then charge. There were different models at different times. At, while they were digging the trench, the Prophet had like a work song, and they would all sing while they were digging the trench. Well, Abu Dhar, his motto and his brand and his log and his and his saying was this. His anthem was this verse, which says, "Verily, those." Oh, hold on a second. The wind has uh, just got my notes. Give me a second. Alhamdulillah, while he's getting his notes, uh, uh, just a comment that uh, uh, Shahanza had made was very pertinent. And justice is the floor, the baseline for Islam. SubhanAllah. Sorry about that. The wind got me. His ayah was verily those who hoard gold and silver. They hoard it. And they don't give it out in the path of Allah, meaning in the rightful path, where it's deserved to be. Give them good news, painful torment. Okay, And he would repeat this ayah so much, everywhere. He would just, he literally was on a mission to make sure that this ayah was on the minds of everyone in the ummah. 
that every child, man, woman, adult would hear this ayah and it would be on their mind constantly. Okay. And so he went around everywhere and, and then he decided to go to the, the root of the source, which is Syria. Syria is where all the wealth was coming in. It's where the people that he viewed were the most corrupt. And he went up to Syria. When Sayyidina Abu Dhar went to Syria, he was actually viewed as a celebrity. They, the children, it is said, ran because they'd never seen a, a, a veteran Sahabi like this before. And they heard he's disheveled, he sits with the poor, he sits with the people, right? And so they ran to him. And he began, and immediately they had already known that that was his verse. And so they would run to him and shouting the, the ayah. And uh, that's how much that's how he was how how much he had disseminated this teaching, right? To the point that children ran up to him, shouting, So he had managed to persuade people and to to get this ayah into people's minds that you know, and he, eventually his power base in Syria became dangerous. So who was ruling Syria at the time? The governor was uh, Sayyidina Muawiyah, another Sahabi, right? But here they had a great uh, dispute. Sayyidina Muawiyah made one of the few mistakes that he's ever really made. And even Ibn Abbas says that Muawiyah, it was uh, that Abu Bakr and Umar were atqa, but Mu'a, he's more pious. But Muawiyah was asyas. He was better at, uh, at siyasa. He was better at dealing with different groups that have all uh, different... Uh, in, uh, uh, purposes and motivations that he was able to manage all of them uh, in a better way. As I say, Abu Bakr and Umar, they feared Allah, they just went straight. But Sayyidina Muawiyah knew that it's a different time, it's a different era, and he's a different person. He didn't have the tarbiyah that they had, right? He's a, he's a noble and great Sahabi, but he, had, he was different. And so he knew how to manage these political groups and these interests. And so he was more politically astute. Well, this was one of the few mistakes that he ever made, which was public debate with Abu Dhar. And so they had this public debate. And the main point of the public debate was, and this is a nice point for everyone to know in general, is that uh, uh, Muawiyah said this ayah was not revealed about Muslims. It was revealed about the priests and the rabbis who were corrupt. Okay, The corrupted priests who used to steal the charity. right? Keep it for themselves. right? Now, we have a rule that we should all know that al ibratu bi umum al or bi umum al nas la bi khusus al tanzil which is that lessons and conclusions that we take from the Quran are all about the language of the verse not the circumstance of the revelation so this this ayah was talking yeah it's true they, they were the circumstance in the surah is about corrupt uh, priests and rabbis but it applies to everyone else the prophet says sayyidna abu dhar said it was revealed about them as a message to us, right? And it was a unanimous victory, this debate, for Abu Dhar. And the proof that it was a victory is that Muawiyah went back and immediately wrote a letter and said, I'm, I'm expelling uh, uh, Abu Dhar, but I can't expel him. He has so many uh, followers. So you, Sayyidina Uthman, call him back to Medina. So Sayyidina Uthman writes a letter to Abu Dhar and he said, I need you in Medina. So that it wouldn't look like Muawiyah is expelling him, right? Again, look at the politics of Sayyidina Muawiyah. He didn't just expel him. He wrote to Sayyidina Uthman, you call him back. Okay, so then Sayyidina Uthman called him back. He said, we want to re reward you. We want to, you know, give you a stipend. We want you to live next to us. We want you to be a barakah in the masjid. And uh, Sayyidina Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, he said, no, thank you. And he said, I would rather live by myself. Okay, and he went to live in an area called the Rabda. Okay, outside of Medina, and he lived and died there. Okay. In the time of the Prophet, وسلم, this fact that Sayyidina Abu Dhar would become a, 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 I don't like to use the word activist, but that's in modern parlance, that's what he became. Okay. He was extremely active in calling out the corruption of the government, okay, of the rulers. Now the Prophet knew that this would happen. And what's this, how do we know the Prophet knew this was happening? At the Prophet وسلم, one time called Abu Dhar and asked him, Oh Abu Dhar, what would you do 
if you saw the emirs go beyond their bounds, the rulers go beyond their bounds. So Abu Dhar, without a doubt, he just pulled up his robe and he had a sword. He looked at his sword and he put it back. He said, Abu Dhar, okay, if this happens, break your sword. In other words, do not use your sword. Okay, do not use your sword. And do not go outside of the uh, wali. In other words, don't rebel against the ruler. That was it. And have patience until you meet me. Three pieces of advice. Don't use your sword. Don't rebel against your ruler and have patience until you meet him. Now, in this three pieces of advice, there's room for something. What is there room for? There's room for talking, right? So he talked. And what did he talk with? He cited the Quran, right? He just kept citing the Quran and everyone knew exactly what it was. He even went to the point that when he would see his old friends, such as Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, he would say to Abu Musa, what is this that you're wearing? You never used to dress like this. Where are you getting this money from? Their money is corrupt. Their salaries are corrupt. So he even went after, he would even talk to his, 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 his friends like this. So he had room to talk. And from that time, Abu Dhar, when he went to go on his speeches, he never carried a sword and he never gathered the people to obey him in anything. All right? Because once you set the precedent that he's being obeyed, right, then that's a rival ruler. Right? So... He never gave orders. He didn't have a hierarchy. He didn't have like an organization. He was just a one-man show. Astaghfirullah for that expression. But he was a one-person movement. Okay, And he spread this ayah on everyone's, in, into everyone's heart. So one, one of the reasons I love this story is because theory is just uh, is actually vapid, believe it or not. And, and the ap actual application of the theory is what's important. And that's why examples, our methodology is examples, right? And Abu Dharr is an example. Sayyidina Umar was an example. That's in the early times. In the latter times, Amir Abdul Qadir is an example. So let me just touch upon, I don't want to dilute the point of Abu Dharr, but let me just touch upon one statement of Sayyidina Umar that gives us our priorities, the priority of a Muslim. So Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab was once asked to renovate the sacred mosque. and I think there's different reports of whether he was asked to renovate the Masjid of the Prophet or the Kaaba. I think it was the Masjid of the Prophet, Allah Adam. That's not the important point. But it was one of the two sacred sanctuaries. And someone said, we have so much wealth. Why don't we renovate the Masjid? Right? Sayyidina Umar said, awla. The stomachs of the poor are priority. They take priority. Okay? Uh, so Sayyidina Umar, rec recognizing this, uh, that the priority, his priority as a ruler was not to go after the rich and take their money, but rather he allowed people to make money, but rather his, his priority was to help the poor. So this is a, brings us a balance in Islam, a balance that I see that in capitalism and socialism, there's sort of a, a battle here, but I think we have this balance in Islam that people, People have the right to make money, own it, and the government doesn't have the right to take it away, right? There's only probably very few cases where the government would have the right in an emergency to take it away, and then maybe they probably have to pay it back. So you have to look into the fit for that. But as a general rule, the uh, sultan does not have any right to the money of anyone else. Okay? But on the other hand, Sayyidina Omar has truly established that the top priority in the heart of the ruler in the heart of, and if it's the ruler, it should be everyone else too, okay, is the stomachs of the fuqara. So much so that a, a, a man came to say to Omar one time and said, oh, Omar, uh, I need to discuss a matter with you. He said, okay, let's discuss it. So they had the meeting. They discussed the matter. And Sayyidina Omar said, it's around, uh, the day is almost over. Why don't you have dinner with us, spend the night in Medina, and go home tomorrow? So the man agreed. So Sayyidina Omar was served fish. A, a plate of fish, and the man was there, and whoever else was there, Sayyidina Omar was usually eating outside uh, with his sahaba, or with it, with the other uh, companions that he, he kept company with, and so they're all eating, and everyone's looking, all of a sudden, this man, he's just devouring this fish, right? Sayyidina Omar said, uh, what's, ma bika? What is with you? So he said, I've, I've um, haven't eaten fish like this uh, for, for seven years, haven't eaten fish. He said, 
Why? You don't have water next to you? He said, no, who can afford it? Right? Just like the man's just regularly talk. who could afford this? So say, no, I'm going to look to his hajj, uh, to, to his servant. And he said, don't serve me fish for another seven years. Right? So say, no, Omar, he always had his eye, his heart. This is the important thing. His heart was with the stomachs of the poor. He did not go to Ibn Abba, to, to Al Abbas, to Uthman, to Sayyidina Abdurrahman bin Auf, and say, give me your money so I can give it to the poor. But rather, he established it as an ethic inside people's hearts that you got to care for the poor. Right. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was passing by with some Sahaba and they passed by Jabal Uhud, the mountain of Uhud. And he, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if I had the mountain of Uhud as gold, I would not be happy to spend a single night with a single coin in the house unless I was saving it to repay a debt. In other words, compiling up to full, fulfill a debt. Right. So uh, the, 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 the idea of People being successful and being wealthy is like promoted in Islam, but the idea of people also caring so much for the fuqara and making that really their number one priority is also promoted in Islam. And so that's one point I wanted to bring up, and the other story was really Abu Dhar. I don't think there is time to get into um, Amir Abdul Qadir, but there is one little thing I'll mention about him. He fought the French valiantly. He didn't have success, but he fought them valiantly. So why, if he fought the French so valiantly, why is it that he's a legend in the West? Why is it he was given medals in France? Why was it that in the West, in America even, there are cities named after him? There was a racehorse in the uh, olden days named after Amir Abdul Qadir. Why? Reason being is that when he was moved to Syria to re retire out the rest of his life, there was ended up being a riot against, by the Muslims, against the Christian neighborhood in Syria. Okay. And Amir Abdul Qadir looked and said, This is haram. This riot is haram. Right? They're people of Dhimma. Right? And the idea that they're Christian and they're not like us, right? What, what does that have to do? So a little bit of nation state mentality came into the mind of some Muslims. And they said, this is us, most Syrian Muslims, right? And they're Syrian Christians, so they went after them. But Sharia doesn't observe that. Sharia observes, these are Ahl al-Dhimma. So he actually mobilized an army to defend these Syrian Christians. So, in, And one of them was the ambassador to, from France. So on the one hand, he spent 17 years or so fighting the French. And then at the end of his life, he's defending the French. Why? Because the one Sharia said so. He's following the same Sharia. The same Sharia that said you can't invade our lands is the same Sharia that says you have to defend Ahlul Dhimma. So he separated between identity politics and he was about following Allah's command. So these are three examples Abu Dhar, Omar, and Amir Abdul Qadir in the points. Abu Dhar, in that he spoke, right? He didn't create chaos, okay? He repeated the same verse of Quran. He used the Quran as his source. Right, The Quran was his source, not some other idea. Secondly, Omar ibn Khattab in that it the pri what is a priority in our hearts? And it's that simple as the stomachs of the poor. Just keep that in your mind, right? The stomachs of the poor take a priority. Because if you think about it, if people are eating and they're well, most likely a lot of other problems will decrease too. Uh, thirdly, it was Amir Abdul Qadir again. His justice was by the Sharia, whether it was for us or against us, right? Or whether it was for the Muslims as a uh, identity group or against the Muslims. So he fought uh, with the Muslims against the French in the first half of his life. Second half of his life, he fought with the Christians against sinful Muslims, right? To stop them from aggressing upon them. So these are our examples, and uh, these examples show application of theory. So. No point in just talking theory, 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 and what did we do and activism. Let's look at these examples because you'll find everything you need to know in the applied living examples of upkeeping justice. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum. Jazakumullah, Imam Shadi. I know you have to jump off for another. Uh, I know, like you were saying, the treadmill of Zoom. Yeah. Um, but I have uh, just 
one particular thing I've mentioned, and I know you've written an article um, and we've published that on Local Matters as well about teaching the next generation. One of the things that one of my pet peeves is uh, our Islamic schools and our uh, we don't teach uh, the incumbency of uh, just, you know, working towards justice or our our Islamic uh, responsibility towards others in in um, our our curriculum mm -hmm. and for young people. And so, if you could have some, or if you had some recommendations uh, for people, for activists to read uh, before they enter any sort of field, and there, you know, a lot of times it's very. Um, uh, it's you know people think it's very glamorous to become an activist, yep. and I'm, I keep thinking, oh yes, lug around some tables, and yep. then you'll understand how yeah. hard it is. But um, so if you, I could quickly ask you for that. Well, I, I'll I'll say a couple things. The first one is um, part of my PhD thesis uh, back that you mentioned in 2003 to 2007. Part of it was. It, uh, summarizing the tafsir of all the verses on commanding right and forbidding wrong. Mm -hmm. And what is activism? We should use the terminology that the sharia uses, right? Al-amr bil ma'ruf wa nahi al munkar, commanding right and forbidding wrong. So in that respect, we should actually start looking at uh, that as our, our as what we're doing, as opposed to activism, mm -hmm. right? And we should look at we're commanding right and forbidding wrong. Now, do you know that this is the highest level of dawah, right? It takes so much just to do it, right? It takes a lot spiritually. In other words, you can't have kibr. You can't have anger while you're doing it. In other words, the incorrect type of anger. You can't be doing it because of another motive. You have to be consistent in yourself. You can't forbid wrong and then skip salah, right? Or not do things right in the sharia. So if we look at everything from the lens of commanding right and forbidding wrong, that's the right way to do things. Um, secondly, Dawood Walid's book should be read in high schools or even middle schools maybe right because people are now becoming activists in middle school it's a trend right mm -hmm. uh as long as your thumb knows how to hit a hashtag you're an activist mm -hmm. right okay not to make fun of anyone i don't mean to be condescending but delete that part but uh that's it's a serious matter to tell people they're not behaving right is a big deal like who are you and what basis do you have and who are you as an example so it's a big deal to do that and secondly i would actually act upon, act, uh, act, do it, do it. Doing it as a wird is far more important than studying it too. Studying it's very important, but doing it is important. And we actually take the kids out here in New Jersey every Friday, and we haven't done it since the quarantine, but every Friday, there's a group. We all meet at the masjid around like uh, six o'clock. We all head to the park and there's a park where all sorts of day laborers and really fuqara, sometimes they're completely wasted right? They can't take care of themselves. And the community puts together some food, right? Sometimes it's like 10 containers of food. Sometimes it's a hundred, right? And we just distribute them. Now, what I notice is when you have the kids seeing these people and seeing it for themselves, they're like, my gosh, people live like this. Like, look at their shoes. Like, look at that little kid, right? That to me is, is that's the greatest curriculum. That's the greatest assignment because they see it. They see a random stranger taking food, taking a mother taking food from a random stranger, giving it to her daughter. I mean, I mean, your parents would never do anything like that. Take food from a complete random stranger and food that's not wrapped, right? Like a cookie or a sandwich. It's not, it was like just made. That shows how poor, how mesquine these families are. So to me, that is a, as a lesson. That's where it begins, right? Uh, that's really where it begins to be able to empathize and to see what people are going through. So those are the things I would say. Commanding right, forbidding wrong, the the Woods Walid's book, and then actually doing it. Yes, it's it's uh, definitely this is something I can say from my experience too with my children, uh schlepping them around all over town yeah. since <laughs> since uh, uh, they were babies. And uh, just even, uh, and then uh, beyond that, like uh, maybe our community understands relief work, mm -hmm. but a lot of times they do not understand advocacy. They do not understand what it takes, the long, um, you know, especially human rights law. Um, and, you know, this is where, uh, Namira, I'm going to bring you into the conversation, how long it takes for those mechanisms of justice to work in this dunya. And um, you know to to stick with it, to stick with it because they don't see it in maybe in their generation. 
Um, and this is something also that uh, it's very hard to explain the work to people who, who are not a part of this work. Uh, before we turn it over, I just want to say, unfortunately, uh, due to time I had to go, I did want to hear Sister Tahira and Sister Namir's talk. I really did want to hear, especially advocacy. Uh, uh, I wanted to learn about these things and hear about it. So I do really apologize, and I hope it's not disrespectful that I had to run. But inshallah, if it's public, then uh, I'll try to find it on your website and, and catch up with it later. So. Okay, inshallah. We'll email right. you, okay. inshallah. Okay. Did you want to say something, Tahira? Oops. Pardon? I was just giving salams. Okay. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay. Let me introduce our next panelist. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Um, so, Namir Islam is a lawyer and a graphic designer. She's also the co founder and community at engagement director of Muslim Anti Racism Collaborative, Muslim Mark, as we lovingly know it. Uh, this is an organization that provides racial justice education and training. Namira previously practiced in poverty law in Flint, Flint, Michigan. She worked in prisoners' rights litigation and interned at at the International um, Criminal um, Court uh, in international criminal law and war crimes for the United Nations at The Hague in Netherlands. Her legal background includes research on racism, global education standards, and the UN Declaration of Human Rights Education and Training. In 2010, Numira was awarded the University of Michigan's Tapestry Award for demonstrating a way of being that contributes to intercultural awareness and relationship building through reflecting the values of social justice, multiculturalism, and diversity. In 2016, she received the Al Hibri Foundation's Young Leaders Award for demonstrating collaborative and inclusive leadership in American Muslim communities. Jazakallah khair and Amira for being here with us. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate Justice for All and everybody who's been behind planning such a conference of a large international scope and bring in so many different topics, weave them together, very important topics. Um, so I'm really honored to, to bring together these two kind of different um, topics sometimes, you know, Islam versus human rights is oftentimes how you see those things phrased. Um, I still remember actually when I was in law school, that topic coming up, this kind of dichotomy that's often presented where it's like, you know, under Islam or with Within Islam or within, you know, Muslim nations or Muslim culture, do, are human rights even um, in existence? Are human rights even available? There's kind of this common narrative that's been placed around um, Islam and human rights. So that's something that you know I'm really looking forward to to talking about. Obviously, in a briefer fashion, right? So just really think about activism, human rights. Um, and really think about the different elements that go into advocacy, especially. So one of the things that I really wanted to mention, just contextualize some of the comments, is the reality around genocide. So one of the action items that Justice for All has been talking about throughout this conference is really taking action against some of our current um, kind of the hot spots around the world with active genocides that are happening or situations where we have gone along that spectrum of, of events that can really lead into a space of genocide, right? Um, and this is something that is unfortunately a reality for, for all of humanity is that it is one of the saddest commonalities that every single region, every single decade of history, there has been a genocide or some kind of mass killing some kind of discriminatory action that has led to mass graves and has led to wholesale destruction of certain communities, right? This is something that has impacted every single part of the world, every decade of history, and it is something that is really, really tragic. And that's why, in particular, I was very interested in how do you combat genocide? How do you actually prevent um, getting to a place of genocide? Once you are in this place, how do you then walk back, right? Um, and I think in this framework of understanding it, um, Hannah mentioned this at the very beginning, that this can be a very depressing kind of um, subject to even work in, to talk about, to explore more of. 
Um, and when I was at the UN's tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, it really struck me. At one point, I was working on a listing of names, right, of people who were um, bodies who were identified because they were found in a mass grave decades after genocide in Bosnia. And I remember sitting there, and as I was looking at this list of names, a number of Muslim names were coming up, right? Names like Hasina, um, names that were very much common names in my own culture, in Bengali kind of uh, Muslims, among Bengali Muslims that you would see these names. And as I'm reading it, I'm thinking, okay, this is back in the 1990s, and these are Muslim names that we're seeing on this, on this piece of paper, right? Um, and it's something that is, is very distressing to think about. So the human rights framework was designed, the modern human, kind of the international human rights framework is really not that old, right? It certainly draws upon decades and centuries of different frameworks that have been developed over time. But when you look at something like the United Nations, the UN Declaration on Human Rights, um, this was established in 1948. And there is a commission of people who came together um, and drafted this declaration. And this is oftentimes seen as the underpinning of our entire modern system. So of course, when we're looking at 1948, what else was happening around that time, right? Um, everything from um, everything happening in Palestine, uh, everything happening with the aftermath of World War II. Um, so much is happening with regards to colonialism um, and uh, imperialism throughout the world. But something like this human rights framework, that was the underpinning to create this system where there are now mechanisms uh, to, to hold certain nations accountable when something is happening within their borders, right? That is the idea behind it. But something that often came up within these discussions, and you'll find this whenever you go into a human rights frame, um, when you're talking with advocates within this, the, the, um, the field, when you're talking to people who are practicing in these tribunals, how do you actually curb human rights violations? When you get to a place where there are war crimes, how do you actually hold people accountable for these behaviors in the time that it takes to prevent, to actually have um, a fair kind of procedure to not use violence, to stop violence? How do you actually have accountability in this framework? So these are some very tough questions. Um, and it can be very difficult to think about when you're seeing certain countries, um, and examples have come up with the Rohingya, with the Uyghurs, all these different um, nations where day by day, sometimes hour by hour, people are dying, right? And you have a situation where this is happening so quickly, uh, where some forces have been mobilized, where whoever is in power is literally bringing together militias to, to exterminate different groups. And then you have these bodies who are, you know, somewhere thousands of miles away sometimes, and they're sitting there trying to discuss, you know, what do we do? How do we do this? Do we invade, right? Do we um, do we try to have sanctions? How do we do this without harming more people too, right? Um, and so the whole thing can set up a lot of frustration, a lot of anger. Um, and so there's a lot of questions and I wanted to just kind of appreciate the complexity of this, that people are trying not to infringe on more rights by trying to stop somebody else who is infringing on rights. Right, um, and the definitions of certain terms like war crimes. Um, when I was at the UN, one of the war crime, one of the definitions that I was researching was what are the elements, the legal elements, if you're trying to say that somebody should be convicted of the war crime of taking of hostages, for example, what are the elements that need to be present for somebody to be convicted, right? Um, but this process, it can take decades uh, after something has already happened. And we're seeing this throughout the world where it's like, what are we doing, right? How can we stop something that is so dire? Um, and there are different mechanisms that have been created, especially over the last 100 years, to try to have some moments where we are able to use different kinds of soft power, essentially, where we're using um, advocacy formats like petitions, um, donating money to certain causes, uplifting the speakers and the advocates who are on the ground, um, who are representing their own communities, making sure that we're at making demands upon people and putting that public pressure on to try and stop something from happening. So that's that context of like the modern, what is considered the international human rights framework. There's a lot of history that, you know, I won't get into today, but there's certainly a lot of um, reading and research that is available about that. So under that context, when you're then thinking about, okay, this is the international human rights law system, 
more modern, right? 100 years, less than 100 years old, very new, kind of, out of all the systems of law, it's one of the newer ones. Then you have this concept of justice. So when we have legal frameworks, whether it's criminal justice, whether it's um, different fields, you have this idea of what is justice. And the reality is almost every single major legal system in the world has recognized that justice is a perfect entity, right? And this has come up before um, in the talk so far. It is a perfect entity. And the reality is that as human beings, and given the ways our systems are set up, we can't accomplish perfect justice. We just can't. There's no way to magically wave a wand and undo the harm that was happening, right? Um, if somebody has been harmed in a certain way, we have approximations to try and get them to be whole again, right? And oftentimes with criminal justice, for example, that's the framework is that somebody was harmed. And so we see this in the criminal justice system in the United States, where if somebody is murdered, if somebody um, is physically harmed, you often have the state versus a defendant, right? The state is going after a specific perpetrator because that person harmed another person and it's not in the best interest of society that this person was harmed. An idea is that especially if somebody has, has died, if somebody has been murdered at the hands of somebody else, has lost life at the hands of somebody else, you can't bring that person back, right? So in that sense, what is justice? How can we make somebody whole? And that's where these different discussions around punishments and um, the idea of making somebody whole, how does that even happen? So given that we have this kind of understanding that there is a perfect justice out there, but we are all trying to approximate to it, um, the idea is that as human beings, and especially as Muslims, right, um, what Hannah mentioned earlier, that sometimes we're trying to describe that these are things that may not even take place within your own lifetime, but it's something that may go forward in generations to come, um, that you may see these outcomes, right, that the current generation is, is kind of, it's a baton, right, that they're passing on to another generation. Um, and it reminds me of the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, saying that if you have a sapling or a seed in your hand and you know that the day of judgment is tomorrow, still plant the sapling, right? Still plant that seed. And this approximation, this idea that we have a certain action that we can take, it's a good action. It's something that is um, really thinking about perpetuating life and moving things forward. We still want to plant the seed. And so a lot of the advocacy, a lot of the things that we are doing um, to really bring about more justice in the world, it is planting those seeds. Even when things seem so bleak and so dark um, and seem like there's really not much hope given the severity of the crimes that we're witnessing, there is still always this need to plant that seed. Um, and the actions that we have are, are crucial to making sure that we are really trying to counter as best as we can regardless of what the outcome may be in our lifetimes that we are pushing things forward, right? So as human beings, all of our souls are yearning toward dignity, toward fairness. Um, as Muslims, we believe in kind of that essential nature of every single soul, right? Regardless of, of their background, their ethnicity, that we're all, all yearning and we all have these kind of innate understandings of, of dignity. What does it mean to have a dignified life? What does it mean to have fairness in our lives? Um, so when we're thinking about other people, especially as Muslims, I love um, Sheikh Hamza's point about you know justice being the floor, being the ground kind of baseline that we are starting from. Because for us as Muslims, like regardless of what other people are doing, um, we are need to hold firm on what is correct and on demonstrating um, a prophetic example of how to behave as human beings to one another, right? Um, so one way that I like to think about advocacy in particular and thinking about activism in particular as well is to really think about the intentions. Um, our actions as Muslims are by intention, right? So when it comes to taking a specific step, whether it's a small signing petition, whether it's showing up at a rally, uh, whether it's donating to our cause, whether it's speaking um, into a mic, speaking to at a city council meeting, um, speaking to your own community, door knocking, whatever action it is that we take, it is so important to set the intentions as to why I'm doing this, right? So a framework for this is, is thinking about the fact that it's not just about the goals, right? What is the goal? I'm trying to get 1,000 people to sign this petition, trying to reach you know, 500 doors. Those are some of the goals that we might have, right? But what are the intentions? 
So one thing that I like to think about is that I'm doing this as a Muslim to worship my God, right? I'm doing this to worship Allah as he deserves to be worshiped. So the idea being that knowing what I know, having the opportunities and the resources and the access on my end to all the things that I have, I have to worship Allah by standing firm for justice, right? And we see this in the Quran so many times, but especially verse 4, 30, 135, to stand firm for justice against oppression, right? Whether that's against um, your family or your own self. So it's very important for us to constantly be reflecting on the fact that we have many goals that we could be striving toward in this world, right? And many people are trying to live dignified lives where they're not engaging in any type of controversy or anything that could be um, potentially destructive to the way that they're living, right? Um, but we've seen so many examples of people who have faced severe consequences, whether it's kind of modern day activists who have been assassinated, but even looking at the prophetic example, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu when he first started community organizing, essentially, in his, in his space, who were the first people that he was creating relationships with, right? These are people who were marginalized, um, people who were not treated well by society, who were at the fringes of society, whether because of their tribal kind of affiliations, whether because they were enslaved, um, because they were poor, uh, because they were from backgrounds that were not considered um, as, as part of the kind of leading class. So he aligned himself with their causes and with, with people in these spaces to ensure that everybody was able to lead dignified lives, right? Um, and to have the ability to worship freely to, and then thinking about once, once Muslims came into more power, thinking about the prophetic example of who was brought into leadership, who was brought into representation, um, who was asked to go make the adhan, right, from the Gaba, who was put into positions of, of treasury, right, and, and maintaining finances. People from underrepresented backgrounds were often put into these roles. Um, and when we look at some of the marriages that were arranged, the different relationships that were aligned, the, the relationship building that was there it is a form of worship to behave with other people, to community organize and to align yourself with people who are marginalized um, and ensure that you are on their team, that you are listening, that you are making sure to honor these people. And that is a form of worship. It is a way of being um, to, to try and follow the prophetic model. So again, when we're doing kind of this modern day work, where we are trying to create coalitions, where we're bringing people together, why? You know, like what is the intention behind it? If this is for the sake of the law, we are absolutely looking at, you know, how many numbers are we getting? Um, what are we generating? Are we trending, right? These things are important to get the exposure that might be needed, but these are strategies. These are not the end goal in and of itself. Um, and if we are doing human rights advocacy for the praise of other people or for what we will get from other people, we are never going to be satisfied with what with what comes from that, right? Um, our goals are to do the work. And again, because of this uh, the structure that we are living in, where these things take time, we're trying to have accountability, trying to have um, justice for all people who are hurt, this takes time and it takes that effort. We also know that we might not get that end result within our lifetimes. So given that, we also need to be setting our intentions that we are doing the work for the sake of the work itself, um, for the sake of the worship that is coming from that work, um, and for, for trying to have this be a means through which we worship a lot and that we're getting closer to God this way. Um, and we have so many examples of, of this and of leadership throughout um, the prophetic example, uh, certainly, but especially in thinking about kind of community organizing where it isn't just about you know, one charismatic figure, uh, it is about the collective altogether, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the last kind of point that I wanted to really touch on before wrapping it up a little bit so we can get to, to questions and answers is really thinking about what are some specific ways that we need to understand how we counter some of the most terrible um, human rights violations that we're seeing, right? So one, it's that reminder that 
the umma, you know, one part of the body, one part of the umma is hurting, it's as if we are one body, right? We should be feeling it, even if we have a tiny sliver um, stuck in our, our finger, right? Um, to be able to have that notion of, of paying attention to where things are happening, what is happening, um, regardless of whether there's a language in common, regardless of whether they are from, you know, part of the world that you know, and the reality is that human rights violations are happening not just you know in certain parts of the world, but happening all throughout the world. So in the United States, we see violations that are happening against uh, indigenous and native communities, against Latinx communities, against African American communities, with oppression and different forms of injustice that are happening here. Um, and then for those who are based in other parts of the world, every single part of the world, there is no single part of the world that does not have uh some kind of oppression happening against people in that land right so we need to be very aware of that and that we are not erasing different struggles that are happening sometimes right outside you know within 30 miles of their door um one of the kind of key things to think about and this has come up throughout this international conference is especially thinking about genocide genocide is a very slow avalanche it doesn't just happen where there's a switch kind of hit where it goes from nothing to uh, you know, mass, mass graves and killing that's happening the next day. It is a very slow process. And so for the average person who may not be involved in a, in a higher capacity just yet on this work, there are so many things that we can do. There is always hope and there's always a way to take some kind of ownership over action, right? So especially thinking about um, Dr. Stanton's kind of the 10 stages of genocide, some of the earliest stages, right, are where we are getting to this dehumanization. And we see this kind of language so frequently that it becomes almost numbing to see the language. But key indicators of something where it is dehumanizing other, other people are seeing people being treated like vermin, right? It's stripping away some of these humanities to so the idea that a certain group of people are like vermin or they're like disease, or they're um, something that needs to be wiped out in order for, for us to have a better world, right? Whenever you see that kind of collective um, blame, that kind of collective language against one specific group where you are stripping them of their humanity, if you hear other people doing this, you're already at a very serious stage, right? That's actually considered stage four is where we are at demonization. And so it is very important as Muslims, we are always guarding our tongues, right? And if we see an injustice, we either change it with our hands, change it in our heart, or change it, um, uh, change it, uh, disagree with it, right? As much as we can. So something where we are getting to a stage where people are being stripped of their humanity, already there's so much that we should be doing to ensure that people are not using, um, you know, discriminatory jokes or offensive language. Um, that we are making sure to always say something if we can to just whether it's gently calling something out or to just very, very politely and firmly say that that kind of language is not acceptable around me. Um, we need to be very firm around that. For all of these other stages, um, I'd really encourage everybody to visit uh, the Justice for All um, website to make sure that we are taking the steps to sign petitions to ensure that there are kind of um, action steps that are being taken for uh, these different campaigns that are happening because there are very strategic things that we can all do to ensure that different governments are knowing uh, people are watching, people are listening, people are paying attention, and people are going to speak out. They are going to ensure that somebody is saying this is not acceptable, right? Um, and that we see what you are doing, we are putting a spotlight on it, and we are ensuring that this is not going to be forgotten. When we say never again about any form of genocide, we have to mean it, right? Um, and even though there are so many instances that it might seem overwhelming, we have to continue planting those seeds and ensuring that we are setting our intentions as to why we are doing it, and that we, even if nobody else is, that we will be that person who is standing alongside and positioning ourselves with people who are being marginalized, um, regardless of our connection, our personal connection to them. Because as Muslims, as human beings, that is our responsibility. Um, and we are going to do that, especially for our own sakes, to avoid hardening our own hearts um, and to ensure that we are um, fulfilling our own duties as, as Muslims. 
Jazak Alakir, uh, thank you so much, Jamira. Uh, it's amazing to hear, um, you know, we started off with a broad framework and we're coming down to how it actually plays out in this dunya, you know, uh, these uh, these concepts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down to us and how we how we act upon them in, in our daily lives as we work on this. Um, now I want to, um, one great thing we have, um, we don't aren't rush for time. Uh, so Tahira, uh, our next guest Tahira, inshallah, I hope to hear um, uh, from her on her work. And um, so Alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that news that we have another half an hour that we're uh, going to be up on the broadcast, inshallah. So um, let me introduce our next uh, amazing sister, Alhamdulillah, Tahir just got off uh, running for Congress. Uh, I'm so amazed and in awe of her. Uh, uh, she's a mother and she's so active. Mashallah, she, Tahira Amtal Wadud runs a successful law practice in Western Massachusetts with a focus on domestic relations and civil rights law. She's a graduate of Elms College in Chico P and Western New England University School of Law in Springfield. Tahira was named 2016 Top Women of Law by Massachusetts Lawyers Weekly. As a volunteer commissioner for the Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women, Tahira advocates for the state legislature to en enact laws responsive to the needs of women and girls. She's a member of the Family Advisory Council of Boston Children's Hospital, where she volunteers as a way of showing her deep gratitude to the hospital for its care of her six-year-old daughter who received life-saving heart surgery as a newborn. Tahir understands the need to prioritize healthcare for every person and is thus an avid supporter of Medicare for all. As a former candidate for the first di district of Massachusetts and alongside small and a longtime small business owner, Tahira prioritized aggressive job growth and development throughout the district. She vigorously promoted a plan to combat climate change, advance a strong universal public education policy, and create opportunities for re reliable and affordable high-speed internet across access for every resident. Thank you so much for being here, Tahira. Oh, you're welcome. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Ramadan Mubarak. It's so good to see both you, Sister Henna, and my friend Namira. Um, it's great to be uh, amongst the wonderful panel that you've pulled together um, on this, this beautiful, wonderful night during these most important times that we find ourselves in. So thank you. Um, there's there's so many um, points that have been made by your speakers, by a friend Namira, who's also a lawyer and has um, approached the fight for justice similarly to the way that I've seen myself sort of injected into this fight for justice. And um, additionally, the work that all of the guests are doing, the henna that you do, uh, since I've known you for the past few years, um, we we all are deeply committed to defending those things which which um, are sacred, standing up against those things which are wrong, and um, engaging and acting as strong, committed citizens in this country of ours. And I'm speaking more so as an American Muslim at this at this particular point. Um, what I would like to do is I I have a a very compelling and interesting story that I think your viewers will appreciate because what we demonstrate in this lived experience is how to stand up for justice when it is standing up for yourself. Very frequently. When we talk about standing up for justice and doing the right thing and activism, it seems to be that we talk about it as if we do this for other people, as if we have this obligation as Muslims to stand up for people who are less fortunate, who are victimized, who are needy. But what about when you have an obligation to stand up for that which is right, when it is your own self, right? Like think about that for a minute, very Frequently as Muslims, we do engage and walk in this world, particularly as American Muslims, with a level of privilege that has us sometimes feeling a little bit 
untouchable as if we are the ones that have the gift to share and not that we sometimes need to be given the gift or that we sometimes need to assert and use and articulate, uh, use our voices and articulate what our needs are because we are commended to do this not just for others, but for ourselves as well. And this is the model. This is the prophetic model. It is the model of all of the messengers. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon them. It is the, the model of the Holy Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and all of the Sahaba, was that they assert it for themselves as well. And of course, that has the residual benefits of, of uplifting an entire community. So let me tell you a story. Um, so it's, it's almost like a, a, a where to begin story. So as you all know that I'm a lawyer, I've been practicing law uh, for about 14 years. The, the work that pays my bills, the work that makes it possible for me to buy Eid gifts for my children and, and food for iftar is that I work in family law, which means that I'm in probate and family court here in Massachusetts, dealing with issues involving families, divorces, custody, visitation, and families pay me to do that, to represent them. That is my my bread and butter in, in, this, in this, uh, this world of ours. However, as a Muslim, as a, 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 a Muslim whose parents became um, Muslim when I was a little girl, um, I also have the benefit of being part of, Muslim, of a Muslim community, a very beautiful Muslim community that has found itself the target of lots of, of racist and discriminatory vitriol. And um, when I was younger, we lived in Brooklyn and um, my parents' generation, under the guidance of their Sheikh, Sheikh Mubarak Ali Shah Jalani, had decided to relocate from the East New York section, predominantly East New York, that's where I live. There were others who also um, had similar mentality around what and how to shape the future of their children. That would be my generation. And they lived in other parts of the city, parts of Queens, parts of Brooklyn. And they had made the determination that remaining in East New York, remaining in the inner city, remaining in urban centers was contrary to the best interest of their families. Now at this time, I was about nine or 10 years old. So I was a little girl going along for the ride of what would be um, an adventure. And a part of the commitment that the adults in our lives had made was to remove the families from the inner city. There was, there was lots of violence, there was street violence. There were all sorts of systems that you know, as, as we look back to what life was like in the eighties and what we see it is not having advanced much now in, in this in this decade. Um, lots of systems that marginalized people find themselves in. And of course, we were um, young African-American Muslim families. So lots of points of marginalization um, there, poor to working class. Um, the parent the, the those in my parents' generations were mostly converts from Christianity. So those in my generation had grandparents who were um, Christian um, and Muslim parents, and then subsequently raising Muslims. So at this point, the community that I belong to is four or five generations of consecutive um, Muslim families. But in the 1980s, that was not something that would be projected to have um, occurred, that we would not have survived living the, in that manner, but for the, the, the call to action by those leaders who decided to remove themselves from the city and they relocated and they purchased pieces of property throughout the country. They cashed out um, savings accounts. They worked very hard and they purchased pieces of land. And one piece of land is upstate New York. It is south east, about 45 minutes southeast of Binghamton, New York. So it's up in the Catskills. It is commonly referred to as the community of Islamberg, I-S-L-A-M-B-E-R-G. And that property was purchased in the 1984, 1985 range. And I think of it a lot as one of those movies where you have like the wilderness family, where the family is like, we're going to leave the city life. We're going to go and, and build a house. And we're just going to live in the wilderness. And we're going to grow 
food and we're going to just just tough it out and live our best lives. And in a lot of ways, that's what Islamburg looked like in 1984. There were a handful of families. And before you know it, you had a couple of dozen. My family personally did not move to Islamburg um, at that time. I, my family moved to Western Massachusetts. And, um, and so we stayed in touch and we celebrated Eids and birthdays and holidays in Islamburg, which is about three and a half miles away from us, but it was not uh, three and a half hours away from us, but it was not, um, it was not where we lived at that point. So what happened was that when you have these families, mostly again, predominantly African-American Muslims, and I'm talking about African-Americans in terms of tracing their roots to the Amer the transatlantic slave trade, you have African-American Muslims who decide to break themselves free of the change of, chains of systems of oppression. What were those systems of oppression? They were everything from um, street violence to racial injustice to economic injustice to educational injustice to um, any any American system that harms minorities we would have been harmed by and had been harmed by for generations at that point you broke free and the families moved upstate New York where they could have a little bit more autonomy, a little bit more privacy, a little bit more control of what their children were being exposed to and how they would shape their futures. But while it sounds wonderful and it looks really cute when you're um, a family on a TV show uh, as part of the dominant culture where people think, rah, rah, good for you. What actually happened to these families is while they were creating um, a, gr a great and strong life for their children. You had white supremacists um, lurking through the darkest and deepest shadows of the internet, creating and manufacturing stories about the community and what they were or were not doing. Now, mind you, this ended up becoming quite a nightmare over years on the internet about what was happening in Islamburg and what these white supremacists, these were people who did not think that African-American people and that Muslim people had the right to own property, had the right to live in peace and had the right to mind their business and to have their business um, private and so what they did was they attempted to vilify this community. So what happened was that lots of internet um, mongering was happening, um, vetriol. It was, um, Islamburg just became sort of a lightning rod for all in the world who thought that we did not deserve this quality of life, that our parents had sacrificed everything to give us. And over the, the period of years, it escalated as the internet became more of a powerful tool. And I'm talking about from 2006 was about when we started um, seeing and, and hearing about chat rooms that were formed until about 2013 when it got unbearable. My colleague, my dear friend who I grew up with in Brooklyn and, and before she had moved upstate and I had moved to Western Massachusetts, taught her to Clark. She and I both being lawyers decided that we would use our law degree and we would use the energy of the community to stand up for justice for ourselves mm -hmm. because nobody else was here to do it for us. And we filed a federal lawsuit against a, an, a, a blogger who wrote a book and also maintained a website that, cre that contained some of the most outrageous claims about this Muslim community and the most outrageous and the most false claims about this community. And so the way it was impacting us was that there would be people who would read these blogs and then they would start to come to the property because they needed to see for themselves. And you have children, there's lots of children. This is a Muslim community, a big uh, a, a population of Muslim families. And so the, the land is very um, rural and sort of remote, but not so remote. So what would happen was that people would come, they would harass the children, they would drive towards the property, they would drive onto the property. And we said, it is time to put our foot down. Now, I just need to let you know that as brave as it sounds, this was very frightening for us. It was also quite isolating. And this was uncharted territory. We had no idea how to file federal lawsuits. 
We had no idea of how to actually marshal the law and use it in a way that would accomplish the goals that we thought we hoped to have accomplished. So Tahara and I spent many, many hours and with those who loved us, with um, the leadership, with our imam being, being there for moral support and figured out how to draft this lawsuit against the bloggers um, to ask that they be found um, having engaged in defamation against this Muslim community and that they be stopped from continuing to promote the lies that it had been promoting and had gained lots of traction. So here we go with our little lawsuit and our uh, complaint that we worked and agonized over for a long time. And before you know it, it we struck back. We struck back. We stood for justice firmly. We didn't know what we were doing, but I'll tell you what, by the time that fight was over, you we we looked beat up, but you should see what happened to the other side. <laughs> our case, our defamation case ended up getting dismissed on a technicality, but it was a, a beautiful decision that the judge had written. I, you don't normally take cases that are dismissed and consider them a victory, but it was a victory because it told the world that we would stand up not only for ourselves, we would stand up for all Muslims and all people of faith who are minding their business and who are living peacefully and the white supremacists cannot stand it. We will be here to challenge you. So that was in 2013 and we predicted in our complaint that if the government did not get control of this, if the FBI did not monitor them, if the federal courts and the judicial system did not hear us, that people would die. We would be victimized, that there would be blood in the hands of American Muslims if this white supremacy threat was not checked. Mm. And in 2015 began one of the more bloody years that I remember for Muslims in this country, because what we imagined would happen began to happen. Mm. The vitriol against Muslims continued to increase. The rhetoric against Muslims continued to increase. Hard feelings set in about Muslim Americans. Muslim Americans are not and definitely were not as united as we should be. And I will speak to that in a minute. And then what happened with the beginning of 2015, we saw the massacre of three beautiful people, students, the Abu Salha daughters and Dia Baraka in February. The entire community of Islamburg and all of the sister communities took those deaths very, very hard. Because what we saw initially is that they were denied the dignity of having their deaths described as being what they truly were, which were hate crimes because those girls wore hijabs. And as a community of Muslims who had suffered and feared for this exact outcome, we knew what it was before that family valiantly advocated to have the deaths of their loved ones named as hate crimes. And so while it felt far away, their deaths were remarkably close to home. And in fact, the community did a Janaza service in absentia throughout the country and in solidarity with the Abu Salha and Barakah families. And just three months after that, Islamburg was dealt another blow. This time, who knocked on the doors except the FBI? To say that a man had been intercepted in his plot to gather a militia and to massacre the community of Islamburg, upstate New York, and other of its locations, particularly in the South. This man had been intercepted on the telephone, on Facebook groups, 
and uh, he had been monitored by the FBI attempting to meet in person. He spoke clearly and articulately about wanting to use machetes and engage in hand-to-hand -hand practice. And he called out the deaths of children as being one of his goals. And then we gathered as a community and realized that our greatest worry and fears were being realized. Some people might think that um, the fact that Robert Dogger was intercepted and stopped was the victory, but we know better. We know that he should have never have gotten as far as he has gotten. And coming from a lineage of proud African-Americans and knowing that many of those folks who were brought here as enslaved people, knowing that 30% of them were Muslim and that Islam has been in the soil and in the lives of Americans for hundreds of years, and possibly even before that with the natives who also believed in monotheistic uh, uh, beliefs, we realized that the arrest of Robert Doggart was just the beginning because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not tell us that once a threat is stopped, you are free. He says, continue to stand for justice even if it is against you and against your own family. Mm -hmm. And so we had work to do. We could not sit and be victimized. And so our work then transformed into working very closely with law enforcement to make sure that they took this threat seriously. Because initially, when Robert Doggett was arrested, they made a plea deal with him that was essentially going to put him on house arrest. And we were going to um, sweep this under the rug and all go our merry way. We were asked not to speak about it. We were asked not to promote that this story had happened, but after about a month of staying quiet and realizing that he was quietly being handled by the Department of Justice in a way that we thought was wholly unjust, we held press conferences, we called the Department of Justice to account, we made victim uh, impact statements, we had developed relationships with members of the interfaith communities, and so we had asked them to weigh in because let me just tell you, if someone with an Arabic sounding name had planned to put together a militia to go and massacre innocent children in the Catskills of, in the mountains of upstate New York, that would be front page news all around the world. But we hear that the suppression of the stories of victims who are Muslim and who are African-American, just like the initial suppression of the deaths of the Abu Salha and Baraka families, compound the trauma and compound the crime that had already been done to them. And we were not going to stand for that. And so for the next couple of years, we were like a thorn in the side. Now this happened in 2015, was initially when the plot was disrupted. But 2016 and 2017, we stood right there like a thorn in the side of the Department of Justice before we became more like partners, right? That relationship did not begin under the warmest of circumstances. But when we realized that we were all in this together because we made sure that the, um, the federal judge overseeing the case knew that we were not pleased with any plea deal, and then at some point, the Department of Justice looked at us like, oh, you guys really are not going away. We need to figure out how to do this as a partnership. We spent two years pushing and we believe that there was a divine, um, a divine intervention and divine guidance with us that made the work of the Department of Justice who were prosecuting this individual and other uh, uh, those who were accessories in this, um, in this plot. Again, isolating, lonely, frightening, but with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's um, guidance and an and internal sense of strength, we were successful. And the Department of Justice ended up getting a conviction 
on all charges against Robert Doggart. All charges. Nobody ever imagined that this would happen. Um, he was 68 years old, and then he was sentenced to 20 years. He's fighting very hard. He's in the federal penitentiary. He's fighting very hard to get out. He is citing the COVID-19 um, pandemic and his advanced age, and the judges have not um, agreed to release him. His case is constantly under appeal, and we watch, and we watch, and, and when appropriate, we also do speak out. The reason that this story is important is this story is greater than just the community of Islamburg. It's greater than um, two lawyers who, ha who have no idea what they're doing in federal court, feeling their way through. What this is, is it's the story of, of, of David and Goliath, so to speak, so to speak, where here we are facing this big system and and we, we feel small and we feel um, as if we are not prepared. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's strength, it was not it was not you who threw the sand, it was him. It was not you who threw the pebble, it was him. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had demonstrated to us that not only when you do his work, he will be there with you, but we always, always hope that other Muslims begin to stand up for themselves. Because one thing that became apparent in our work was that Muslims were not standing up for themselves. Mm -hmm. Very constantly, you would hear these stories of Muslims cowering away, uh, of their children being bullied in school, and and when and they became very passive. They did not want to rock the boat. They did not want to upset their idea of American dream. But for African Americans, uh, we we always push this country to its greatest ideals. And so being paired with being Muslim and African-American, we were completely unstoppable. We had nothing to lose. And so our example, hopefully became an example for other American Muslims that you must stand up for yourself. The idea of justice is not for people who live outside of our borders or for people who are hungry or for people who do not have education. It is for ourselves because there is at this point in my mind, no greater group of people, no more able group of people to affect change in this world than the American Muslim because we are guided by the most perfect direction and that is in the Holy Quran and the Sunnah of the Holy Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we are in a country where we are afforded the constitutional right to be great so why have not we married these two things to change the condition of the people here in this world and to continue to promote and support human rights throughout the world throughout this country and throughout the world there is a reason for that there's a reason for that. And I may be getting off to a whole other topic and it may be the the, the subject for a show for a whole other day. But oh, the we I'm gonna just say that to you, Tahira. I'm gonna have you back on. I don't know if you guys know, I started a show called Justice for All Now. Ah. Um, there's so much to discuss and I would love to have you back on and have lots of things that I would love to talk to both of you uh, about. I know we're running really short on time. We have a couple of minutes left, but I am so grateful for you to share this powerful, powerful story. It's it's something that has, you know, it, it, it just works me up every time I hear it from you or read about it or see tweets about it. And um, your victory is really, really our victory. And, and the Islamburg case is a textbook case for oppressed communities to study, to see what was done right, what for to to take steps and use uh, from within and not feel like they don't have uh, anything that they can fall back on to fight against the oppressors. Because that is, I feel like a lot of times we fall into this victimhood mentality and we uh, look for um, others to come and rescue us. And sometimes it's, it is, you need that. You need someone to be the abolitionist, right? Yeah. But sometimes you need to be that person who stands up and that is what you and um, Tahira Clark, mashallah, and the whole Islamic community, subhanAllah. Um, I, since we're so short on time, I, uh, if people have any quick questions on comments, please pass. I know we can't ask Dr. Shadi any questions he has left. Um, I had a quick question for Dr. Uh, Sheikh Hamza, uh, if he can join us for a minute uh, or so, that would be amazing because some of the things that I um, 
that I just it like you we were talking about earlier it is so heavy on the heart when you do this every day and it is um and i i really really want to encourage the community to take some of this burden off these few shoulders that are leading it in uh, the american muslim community in the canadian muslim community or wherever this is being seen this is the this is the work of everybody you know no one has a a a um uh, like uh you know it that no one owns this work this work has to be done by the people and we need your help every day i mean i cannot tell you uh and we say this over and over again when we walk into a congressperson's office they know exactly how many people call them about that topic every day they know i got 11 calls on india i got 17 calls on black lives matter i got three calls on on your issue i got 15 calls on you know 500 calls on healthcare they know and they work for us and this is something that the muslim community need to use um oh, alhamdulillah sheikh uh, hamza is on uh, sheikh hamza one thing that i wanted to ask you was um and maybe this we can set this up for another discussion because i have been wanting to ask a few things about generational uh back and forth between activists and scholars um but um i just want to ask is there like a word or you would suggest to recite on the regular or what would what would you like activists to do when we are faced with heavy decisions um or when we are really struggling uh, in this work. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Barakallahu feekum. I apologize. Uh, I just had to step out. That's why my camera is not on, but I was with you through the program. Uh, you know, I think this is a good this is a good question and uh, I actually especially given the uh, the kind of tension and disconnect with regards to you know the different type, you know different uh, uh, classes of the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. I actually have on my uh, on my SoundCloud account, mm -hmm. uh, SoundCloud.com forward slash hmakbul. I have dedicated my yearly, nightly uh, Ramadan majlis to talking about these issues, kind of from a uh, theoretical perspective, because you have you know decisions and decision making processes that you know, they seem to be kind of like a civil war within Islam because you have a set of people who are, I guess, uh, uh, concerned with the uh, sacred law and with its preservation and proper observation. And then you have a set of people who are uh, concerned with the practical welfare of the Muslim community. And unfortunately, uh, you know, because the majority of the history of Islam uh, this chasm wasn't there. This is kind of like an imported chasm that uh, 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 we've kind of taken on from post-colonial trauma and from the hegemony of another culture that that was never able to integrate, uh, 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 you know, knowledge of politics or material sciences uh, into into their their religion. Um, so we have this we have this problem, and so as far as the weird and as far as dhikr is concerned. That's very important. And there's many awrad that a person can do. But part of the dhikr of Allah Ta'ala is also learning. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're a, you know, if you're a person who is in the activist space, uh, it doesn't obviate the requirement to learn uh, your fardain, you know, uh, learn from the, from the ulama and from the books of deen how to pray uh, properly, uh, uh, you know, from a, from an authoritative text rather than from, you know, informal settings, you know, how to mm -hmm. fast, how to give, how the law of zakat works. It's breathtaking how few people know how proper zakat distribution works, especially given Dr. Shadi's uh, beautiful presentation about Sayyidina Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu. Uh, and more important than those probably for an activist uh, is uh, the, the basic creed of Islam. And for that reason, I also teach in person and also have online and YouTube, you can find an entire, within something like 13 to 15 lecture hours, uh, an entire reading of the Aqid al-Tahawiyah, which is a basic primer in, in Islamic beliefs, it contains many things that people haven't heard before, 
or things that they've heard before, but with an application that they never considered before. Mm -hmm. And then uh, on top of that, the third dimension of a person's, uh, you know, upbringing is their spirituality and uh, ideas about Ihsan and Adil and things like that. Oftentimes what, what we do is we take uh, uh, other, other people who are working for justice and because justice is good, we basically take the way that they work for their justice and uh, just say Bismillah and Assalamu Alaikum on it and say, look, I'm a Muslim uh, activist. And we have a native movement within Islam that has been with the Ummah since the time of the Prophet وسلم, that has adab for seeking justice which are integrated with uh, with our beliefs and with our practices and that are positive both in this dunya and in the hereafter whereas oftentimes some of the movements for justice when they get perverted they can actually end up uh, taking a person further into injustice than than when they began so my my plea to uh, the people in the activist space is don't ignore this this uh, obligation on every muslim uh, to learn these three basic sciences and then my uh, plea to the ulama is to uh, reach out to the people of you know, the people who are serving uh, our communities, those lawyers who are doing things that, like Sister Namira and like Sister Tahira, inspiring stories uh, of those things, those lawyers who are doing those things, and uh, uh, the people who are in politics, the people who are in, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in serving the poor and serving underprivileged communities uh, abroad and at home, uh, that they should reach out to them and try to re re maintain cordial relationship, but it's a, a two-way street. And nobody benefits from that relationship breaking except for shaitan and except for the oppressor. Okay, subhanAllah. Exactly. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I know we're, we're wrapping up now. Jazakallah khair. I'm going to have all of you back inshallah. And uh, for all of you who, ha who have been watching us um, and been a part of this amazing conference, Jazakallah khair. Please continue to support our work. Um, giving at justiceforall.org. Uh, please visit the website for action alerts. We have a Save India action alert that is absolutely imperative for you to act on. We need to stand up to for the Indian Muslim brothers and sisters. Uh, otherwise, we will see what we have seen in Burma and East Turkestan happen if we do not preempt it, we, if we do not prevent it. Um, so, Jazakallah Khair. Thank you so much to all of you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam.